talk about Y Combinator, uh, I guess. I guess you guys all, all know about that. Uh, let me introduce myself briefly while uh, things are loading here. So uh, my name is Balaji Srinivasan. Um, there's actually 12 people with my same first and last name in the Bay Area alone. Uh, <laughs> in, in fact, I randomly ran into another one of them at Stanford and founded a genomics company with them. My, I go by my full initials BSS, and uh, I uh, am a Stanford lifer. I uh, got my BSMS PhD at Stanford, uh, and in 2006, I uh, started teaching computer science and statistics there. Um, I left Stanford in early 2008, scandalizing the department to found a genomics company, which has become very successful. Um, our name is Council, and uh, we test about 3% um, of all births uh, in the United States. Uh, I've also taught a MOOC at um, startup.stanford.edu, which has become uh, quite successful. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk about something uh, fairly different today. So, can we go? Yes? Works? Okay. So, um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, something I'm calling um, Silicon Valley's ultimate exit. And so, as motivation here, you know, it's a bit topical. Um, is the USA the Microsoft of nations? We can uh, take this uh, sort of thing and we can uh, expand it. Code base is 230 years old, written in an obfuscated language. The system is shut down for two weeks straight. Systematic FUD on security issues. Fairly ruthless treatment of key suppliers. Uh, generally favors its rich enterprise customers, uh, but uh, we still have to buy it. And, you know, if we think about Microsoft itself, um, there's a great quote from uh, Bill Gates in 1998. What displaced uh, Microsoft? What, uh, you know, what did he fear? It wasn't Oracle or anybody like that. What he feared were some guys in a garage um, who happened to be, uh, ultimately, we found it was Larry and Sergey back in uh, 1998. And the thing about uh, what Larry and Sergey did is there's no way that they could have reformed Microsoft from the inside. At that time, Microsoft already had 26,000 employees. Joining his numbers 26,000, 26,001, and then trying to push for 20% uh, time or free lunches, uh, they probably wouldn't have gone too far. Um, so what they had to do was start their own company. They had to exit. And with success in that, uh, in that alternative, then Microsoft would imitate them. And this is actually related to a fundamental concept in political science, the concept of voice versus exit. If a company or a country is in decline, you can try voice uh, or you can try exit. Voice is basically changing the system from within, um, whereas exit is leaving to create a new system, a new startup, or to join a competitor sometimes. Loyalty can modulate this. Sometimes that's patriotism, which is voluntary, and sometimes it's lock-in, which are involuntary barriers to exit. And we can think about this in the context of various examples and start to get a feel for this. So, um, you know, voice uh, in you know, the context of open source would be a patch, exit would be a fork. Uh, voice in the context of a customer uh, would be a complaint form, um, whereas uh, exit would be taking your business elsewhere. Voice in the context of a company, that's a turnaround plan, exit is leaving to found a startup. And voice in the context of a country is voting, while exit is immigration. So up there are those two images. On the left is the normal Rockwell painting on voice. On the right is actually uh, my dad in the center, and that's uh, you know, kind of a grass hut on the right-hand side. So he grew up on a dirt floor uh, in India and uh, left um, because India was an economic basket case, and um, there's no way that he could have voted to change things within his lifetime, so he left. Uh, and it turns out that while we talk a lot about voice in the context of the U.S. and talk about democracy, um, that's very important, but... You know, we're not just a nation of immigrants, we're a nation of immigrants. We're shaped by both voice and exit. Starting with the Puritans, you know, they fled religious persecution. The American revolutionaries, which, you know, left England's orbit. Uh, you know, then we started moving west, leaving the East Coast bureaucracy to go to the Western nations. Later, late 1800s, Ellis Island, people leaving pogroms. And in the 20th century, fleeing Nazism and communism. And sometimes people didn't just come here for a better life, they came here to save their life. That's the you know, airlift in, in, uh, at the end of Saigon. Um, and it's not just the U.S. that's shaped by exit. Silicon Valley itself is also shaped by exit. You can date it back to the founding of Fairchild Semiconductor uh, with the Traitorous Eight and the founding of Fairchild. Um, the fact that non-competes are not enforceable in California... Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that VC funds disruption, not just turnaround. You know, the concept of forking in open source, 
You know, if you think about the back button, that is in some ways one of the cheapest ways to exit something. And of course, the concept of a startup itself. That right there, if you guys haven't seen, is one of Y Combinator's first ads. Larry and Sergey won't respect you in the morning. Uh, so the concept here uh, is that exit is actually an extremely important force in complement to voice. And it's, it's something which is um, uh, something that gives voice its strength. So in particular, it protects minority rights. Um, in the upper left corner, for example, you can imagine two countries, and country one is following policy A and country two following policy B. Some minority, you know, is potentially interested in following policy B, uh, where, but A is very stridently, you know, promulgated by the majority. Um, however, there's some other country, maybe a smaller country, maybe another country, that's actually quite into B. And so that person leaves. And, you know, they're not necessarily super into B, but they think it might be interesting, thus B question mark. And what happens is that all the other guys in, in A see that people are actually leaving. They really care about this particular policy so much that they actually left. It could be a feature where people are leaving for a competitor. Uh, it could be a bug that you haven't fixed so people fork the project and take it somewhere else. But what happens is exit amplifies voice, right? So it's a, it's a crucial additional feature for democracy is to reduce the barrier to exit, to make democratic voice more powerful, more successful. And so a voice gains much more attention when people are leaving in droves. And, you know, if uh, I would bet that exit is a reason why half this audience is alive. Many of us have our ancestors who came from, you know, China, Vietnam, Korea, you know, Iran, places where there's war or famine, economic basket cases. Exit is something that I believe we need to preserve, and exit is what this talk is about. So... Exit is really a meta-concept. It's about alternatives. It's a meta-concept that subsumes competition, forking, founding, and physical immigration. It means giving people the tools to reduce influence of bad policies over their lives without getting involved in politics, the tools to peacefully opt out. And if you combine those three things, you know, this concept of the U.S. is a Microsoft of nations, the quote from Gates and uh, Hirschman's treatise, you get this concept of Silicon Valley's ultimate exit. Basically, I believe that the ability to reduce the importance of decisions made in D.C. in particular, without lobbying or sloganeering, it's actually going to become extremely important over the next 10 years. And you might ask, why? What does this have to do with anything? So the reason why is that today it's Silicon Valley versus what I call the paper belt. So there's four cities that used to run the United States in the post-war era. Okay? Boston with higher ed, New York City with Madison Avenue, you know, books, Wall Street, newspapers. Los Angeles with movies, music, um, Hollywood, and of course DC with laws and regulations formally running the country. And so I call them the paper belt after the rust belt of yore. Um, and in the last 20 years, uh, a new competitor to the paper belt arose out of nowhere, Silicon Valley. And by accident, we're putting a horse head in all of their beds. Right? We are becoming stronger than all of them combined. And to get a sense of this, um, you know, Silicon Valley is reinventing every industry in these cities. That X up there is supposed to be a screenplay for, you know, the paper of L.A. And L.A. is going to iTunes, you know, BitTorrent, you know, Netflix, Spotify, YouTube. That's really, that was really the first on the hit list, starting in 99 with Napster. New York, right alongside AdWords, Twitter, Blogger, Facebook, Kindle, Aereo, we're going after newspapers, we're going after Madison Avenue, we're going after book publishing, we're going after television. Aereo figured out how to put a solid-state antenna in a server farm so they don't have to pay any TV fees for over there recording. Recently, Boston was next in the gun sites, Khan Academy, Coursera, Udacity, and most interestingly, D.C. And by D.C., I'm using it as a metonym for just, you know, government regulation in general, because it's not just D.C., it includes local and state governments. Uber, Airbnb, Stripe, uh, Square, and of course, you know, the big one, Bitcoin, uh, are all things that threaten D.C.'s power. It is not necessarily clear that the U.S. government can ban something that it wants to ban anymore. And so because of this, it's something I call the paper jam. Uh, the backlash is beginning, okay? You know, more jobs predicted for machines, not people. Job automation is a future unemployment crisis looming. Imprisoned by innovation as, you know, tech wealth explodes, Silicon Valley, you know, poverty spikes. They are basically going to try to blame the economy on Silicon Valley. To say that it was the iPhone and Google that done did it, not the bailouts, the bankruptcies, and the bombings. And, you know, this is something which we need to identify as false, and we need to actively repudiate. 
So we must respond via voice. You know, the obvious counter-argument is that the value reduces prices. In the top, it's a little small, but that's a famous graph, you know, consumption spreads faster today, that shows the absolutely exponential rise of technologies over the last century. You know, anything that is initially just the province of the 1%, whether it be computers or cell phones, uh, quickly becomes the province of the 5% and the 10%. That MVP that barely works, that someone is willing to pay thousands and thousands of dollars for, allows you to fix the bugs, to get economies of scale, to bring it to the 10% and the 20% and the 50% the middle class, and then the 99%. That's how we got cell phones from you know, a toy uh, for Wall Street to something that's helping the poorest of the poor all over the world. Technology is about reducing prices. The bottom curve there is Moore's Law. And by contrast, the paper belt raises them. There's the tuition bubble and the mortgage bubble and the medical care bubble and too many bubbles to name. And so the argument that you know, the valley is a problem is incoherent, but um, you know, it, it's not going to be sufficient to respond via voice. We can make this argument, but the ultimate counterargument is actually exit. And not necessarily physical exit, but exit in a variety of different forms. What they're basically saying is, you know, rule by DC means people are going back to work. And the emerging meme is that rule by us is rule by terminators who are going to take all the jobs. Um, whereas we can say, and we can argue, you know, DC's rule is more like, uh, you know, a ruined building in Detroit. And down right there is actually like a Google data center, right? And so we can go back and forth verbally, but ultimately this is about counterfactuals. They have aircraft carriers. We don't, we don't actually want to fight them. Um, it, wouldn't be smart. Um, so we want to show what a society run by Silicon Valley would look like without actually affecting anyone who still really believes the paper belt is actually good. And that's where exit comes in. So what do I mean by this? What do I mean by Silicon Valley's ultimate exit? It basically means build an opt-in society, ultimately outside the U.S., run by technology. And this is actually where the valley is going. This is where we're going over the next 10 years. That's where mobile is going. It's not about a location-based app. It's about making location completely irrelevant. So Larry Page, for example, wants to set aside a part of the world for unregulated experimentation. That's carefully phrased. He's not saying, you know, take away the laws in the U.S. If you like your country, you can keep it. Um, same with Mark Anderson, right? The world is going to see an explosion of countries in the years ahead, double, triple, quadruple countries, right? Since the end of the Cold War, we've just been seeing them, you know, burst up in all kinds of places. And some of the best will have lessons for all the rest. You know, Singapore's healthcare system is an example to the rest of the world. Estonia actually has, uh, you know, digital parking meters and all kinds of things. We can copy those things without necessarily taking the risk. Let them take the risk, and then we can, we can copy them. It amplifies voice. So... Importantly, you don't have to fight a war to start a new company, okay? Um, you don't have to, you know, kill the former CEO in a duel. Um, so a very important meta concept is to create peaceful ways to exit and start new countries. So, you know, two of the founders of, uh, you know, PayPal, uh, Peter Thiel, is into seasteading. Elon Musk wants to build a Mars colony. And you can scale it back, too. You know, even on Hacker News just recently, within the you know, realm of someone on, on startup number one versus startup number two, um, these guys just went and brought a private island. It's random. It's, you know, in the middle of Canada. It's freezing cold. It's, there's sticks over there. It doesn't exactly look like Oahu. Um, but the best part is this. The people who think this is weird, the people who sneer at the frontier, right, who hate technology, they won't follow you out there. Okay? That's the thing about, you know, exit is you can take as much or as little of it as you want. You don't have to actually go and get your own island. You can do the equivalent of dual booting or telecommuting. You can opt out to whatever level that you prefer, right? Simply, you know, going on to Reddit rather than, you know, watching television is a way of opting out. There is this entire digital world up here which we can jack our brains into and we can opt out. Um, the paper belt may stop us from leaving, and uh, that's actually what I think of as one of the most important things over the next 10 years is to use technology, especially mobile, to reduce the barriers to exit. Um, you know, with it, we can build a world run by software. Here's some examples. 3D printing will turn regulation to DRM. It'll be impossible to ban physical objects uh, from medical devices to drones to cars. You can 3D print all these things. And there are entire three-letter regulatory agencies that are just you know, devoted to banning goods. With, you know, Bitcoin, you know, capital controls become packet filtering. Um, it's impossible to do bail-ins if everyone's on Bitcoin um, to seize money as they did in Cyprus or in Poland. 
With quantified self, medicine is going to become mobile. You're going to be able to measure yourself. With telepresence, your immigration policy is going to turn into your firewall. Double robotics is just the start, you know. Any bots, these, you know, robots that you can control remotely, moving them around like a Doom video game. Um, soon they'll be humanoid on their side, and they're going to get pretty good. So you can be anywhere in the world walking around with a humanoid robot on their side uh, and, you know, without paying a plane ticket. Drones, warfare is going to become software. Law is going to become code. Management via robotics is going to become automation. And property rights are going to become a network effect if you know about Bitcoin smart property. So technological details, these are topics for the next MOOC. Um, you can sign up at uh, Coursera.org, front slash course startup. Um, it'll be uh, better the third time around. Um, but that's what I think, you know, if, if you want to think big, if you want to think about things that are next, build technologies as minimal or as maximal as you want for what the next society looks like. It could be something as simple as allowing people, you know, the middle class to make tax shelters, uh, you know, apps that allow people to travel and relocate better because it's a huge pain to move from city to city. Um, anything you can think of that reduces the barrier to exit, that, that reduces lock-in. If we work together, we might be able to build something like this. Thanks. This is Jason King for Bitcoin 100, and you're listening to Let's Talk Bitcoin. But you know, Bitcoin is not really a talker. It's a doer, just like the best nonprofits and charity organizations. And at Bitcoin100.org, all we do is find hardworking nonprofits and charities and give them $1,000 in Bitcoin. That's all we do. So donate to Bitcoin 100 and let Bitcoin, nonprofits, and charities do what they do best.